Okay, so we're recording now on Zoom. So this will be up later on YouTube so you can watch it back um, if you don't get everything today. But we'll be doing everything on the screen today. So for the people not looking at the screen, it might be difficult to work on your computer and look at the same time. Um, Soren, I don't know if you were here a minute ago, but it is being projected onto Zoom. So if you wanna join a Zoom link and have that up on your screen as well, instead of having to look back and forth, you could do that um, up to you. Or if you just wanna sit uh, at an angle and look, that's fine too. Um, but was everyone uh, on Zoom for class last Tuesday, or are there any new people? Okay, you just signed up, or you just weren't there? Because um, I know some people signed up like recently. I didn't know it was on Discord, so I didn't know how to find. Oh, them. gotcha. Okay, okay. Yeah, no problem. So last week we went over like the basics of Rhino and Grasshopper. Um, so I won't be covering much of that today, since most people got that introduction. I'll still be explaining everything that's going on. If you don't know anything about Grasshopper Rhino, I don't know what your skill set is. Um, but are you on the Discord now just yes. to make sure everyone else is there so you're getting notifications? Okay, cool. Um, so we did a basic of what all the tools are. Today we'll actually be using some of them and we're doing um, what I'm calling a Voronoi and a tractor point kind of workflow today so we can see um, how you make complex patterns in Grasshopper. Um, I'll stress the coding part isn't that complex, but the shapes and images and uh, 3D geometry we can make will be pretty interesting. So uh, we'll do some more creative coding today and hop into that. So um, we're just gonna jump into Grasshopper. So hopefully everyone can follow along. I do have the key capture thing. Where is that again? Or is that a different thing? I don't know. We had a key capture last time so you could see what I was pressing. I don't know if that was helpful or not. I don't know if we'll have that today, but I do have names for components today. Oh, that's a different one as well. Um, okay, so now hopefully everyone can follow along a little bit better with names projecting on the screen as well as the images. Um, for those of you who might not remember from last time or just don't know, with all these, I'm going to call these components the stuff I'm bringing up on screen. And if you want to bring the same one up, all of them are up in this bar at the top, which is where you can find all of the like. I'd say the commands you can do in Grasshopper. Um, or what you can do to find them is if you double click on the screen, a little search bar will come up. And then you can type in the name of any component I have or type in the name of one that you want to bring up. And it'll do a search and bring up the most, um, the components that match what you're writing. So just a little intro there. So you know how to bring up the things I'm doing on the screen. If anyone has questions while we're going through the course, feel free to ask at any point uh, so we make sure everyone's on track. I'm just going to move this away. Okay, so today, some of the stuff we'll be looking at just to give you kind of an introduction of what it looks like is Voronoi patterns. And the word Voronoi is a term for like whenever you have a pattern um, where each, it's like made up of cells and each cell kind of butts up against the next one in an organized way. So we'll be working on creating something like this today. This is a 2D Voronoi pattern. And we'll also be looking at in the tutorial workflow that comes right after this, but in today's class, like a 3D Voronoi as well. So going from 2D cells to 3D cells in space. And we'll be doing both of these today. Okay, so before we start, does anyone have like questions of just getting started with Grasshopper so we make sure we're all following along? Or is everyone at least a little bit comfortable with how it works? Okay. Yeah. If you have any questions, feel free to speak up. But okay, so first thing hopping into the workflow we'll do is the first thing to start with the 2D Voronoi's bring up a bounding rectangle of the size of the pattern that we want to create. So we kind of just want to draw um, the flat pattern that the Voronoi cells can exist within. And let me just hide these. We don't need them at the moment. Okay, so clean slate. So we'll start with just a basic rectangle. So this will draw the boundary of the pattern we're going to create. So uh, as it seems, we'll just type in rectangle and this orange one will come up here. And this will allow us to just make a very simple rectangle in the scene. Once you bring it in, you should see something coming up in Rhino as well. Um, you can organize the screens however you want, but my Rhino is going to be on the left, Grasshopper's on the right. 
so once you bring it up, there should be this rectangle. Um, and in Rhino, you'll see the rectangle as well as the plane that the rectangle exists within. Um, so every piece of geometry that you bring in, like this primitive rectangle uh, into Grasshopper slash Rhino needs a plane to be oriented to. Uh, and that plane is going to be this little crosshatch pattern right here. So that'll always come up if we just have a rectangle or if you have a sphere in the scene or something like that, this will come up. Um, what I'm going to do is add an XY plane just to fully define the rectangle and make sure we know that the rectangle is going to be on that XY plane. Um, in Rhino, you'll notice in the bottom left, we do have the coordinate system down here and it will show you when you're rotating in the scene how the coordinates are updating. Uh, and XY corresponds to the X and Y there, and that's just the flat base plane. So once we have the XY in here, um, you'll see that we have inputs on the rectangle and any component in Grasshopper um, has inputs and outputs. As I said in last class, if you hover over any of the options, it'll give you a little um, recommendation of what it needs. So if we hover over the P in the rectangle, um, it'll show that it needs a base plane. Right now, um, like as it comes, it always comes with XY, but if you wanna change that, you could put in whatever other plane you want. Um, you could do the basics like YZ, or ZX, or you can make your own plane that exists in any angle. Um, but with the XY, we can plug that into the P, and that won't change anything. But the only reason I do this is because I just want to see the rectangle to make it clear for everyone what's happening. Um, so one thing we can do with the plane and the rectangle wired together, so we have this wire connection here, um, connecting the two, uh, passing data across. What we can do is if we right click on any component, um, and specifically you have to right click either on the image of the component or the name of the component. Um, if some people's screens look like this with names, you would be right clicking where it says it. Um, or I usually keep it in this display mode drawing the icons because um, it's a little bit more clear at a glance what each little image is, what little thumbnails are versus uh, a word right there. So if we right click on the middle, we can pull up this menu. And if we hit preview, that'll unpreview the plane, and then that'll go away from Rhino. So now we're only left with the rectangle on the screen. This just makes it easier to see what's happening. Some things we can do with the rectangle, if everyone's at this point, is to um, define the boundaries of this rectangle. Right now, we can see that the X and Y size come predefined at negative one to one and negative two to two. But if we want to change that, um, we can add a value slider in, and this is just basically a way to input data and still keep it um, editable uh, while we're coding in Grasshopper. Um, so like I explained last class, in the very first panel in Grasshopper, we have a lot of the basic inputs that you'll use pretty commonly uh, in Grasshopper. Uh, so the one that I want to use, what I just said, is the number slider. So under input, we have this number slider here. And if we pull this one in, this will give us kind of you know, a dial that we can move with our mouse to change numbers on it. And we can use this to define the scale of the rectangle. One thing I wanna do though, since this slider comes in stock at zero to one, that's a pretty small number. I wanna make this rectangle on the screen a lot bigger so we can see a lot better what's happening inside of it. So what we can do with the slider is if you right click anywhere on this slider, slider you'll get this list that comes up. And in this list, um, either clicking edit or clicking the values, um, we can easily update the domain of the slider. So like the first and last number um, that it exists in. And then once we change that, we'll have a slider that goes from different numbers. In this case, I'm gonna go from zero to hundred. So if we go in to values and edit the max, I can change the max from one to hundred. And now that slider has a lot more range inside of it. So once I did that, um, and some of you may notice too, when you're changing these numbers, whether you're in the values dropdown or you're in the edit panel itself, um, when you change the number, you have to hit the green check mark twice for it to actually uh, go in. So I'll just hit it twice. And now you'll see that we have a range from zero to hundred here. So we can set these values to whatever you want. Um, I'm gonna set mine to hundred on the X and 50 on the Y. Um, so what I can do is copy and paste this slider 
and I can drag it down around 50. It doesn't have to be exact. It can be whatever you want. Um, if you have different numbers, it's not going to affect how the workflow goes for you. you. You'll just have a different looking output. So with these two sliders, with whatever two numbers you have, um, if we go back to the rectangle, we'll notice that we fulfilled the plane input, and, but now we have the X and the Y, so we can use these numbers for the X and the Y. So if you drag from the right side of the slider, into the left side of the rectangle, you can connect it to both the Y and, and, and the X values there. And then depending how big you made the numbers, you may have to zoom out, but once you zoom out, you'll see that the rectangle has gotten much bigger on the screen. And you can change these values in real time and you'll see the rectangle will, will change to follow. So now that everyone hopefully has a rectangle on the screen, we can move ahead to the next part. Um, what we'll do now is, as I said, um, it's a Voronoi and a tractor points workflow. So um, what we'll have is the Voronoi pattern, but we'll, it'll also be denser in some areas than others. And we'll control that density of the pattern with some points that we put in Rhino. And we can move those points and see the density of the cells update and change as we move. Um, so that's the next thing we'll want to implement into this. So getting into that, um, we'll want to uh, convert the rectangle to a surface so we can map some points on that surface and figure out uh, relative to the bounds of the rectangle where those points are. Um, so the first thing to do, and as I mentioned last class, um, data types in Grasshopper are very specific. So you want to be careful what data types you use. Meshes are different than B-reps, are different than surfaces, different than curves, and so forth. Um, so right now I'm looking to um, create a surface out of this rectangular curve. Um, so what we'll do is it is called boundary surface. It's also in the surfaces freeform tab. Um, this boundary surface, what it'll do is it'll take um, an outline. So in this case, the rectangle. And if we plug that rectangle into the boundary edges, it'll create a surface off of this. So pretty simple. We'll just plug those two together and we'll get a surface just like that. So now if we hover over S on the component we just added, it'll say, um, we have one untrimmed surface. So we have a surface data type, uh, which is good. And you'll see why in the next step, why we need this surface. Um, the next thing we'll bring in is we want to evaluate the surface so we can add those two points onto it. Um, so I'll grab an evaluate surface component. And it's the second one here. It looks like this little um, half sphere with an arrow coming out of it. And when you're searching in Grasshopper, you never, you don't have to ever type the full name of the piece. Um, right now I typed evaluate surface, but we could do um, the first two letters of both names of that and it'll still come up. So if you've used Grasshopper for a while and you know in your head the names of the components, you can shorten each one to be a little bit quicker. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll bring that in and you'll see this first input here is a base surface. So we have the surface already from that rectangle. So we can plug that surface into the surface input there. Now this won't do anything. And you'll see that if you click off of the component, it's orange and there's this little yellow balloon bubble that pops up. And if we click on that bubble, we'll see what the error is. So we have like real-time debugging with the code that we're writing here. Um, and in this case, if we hover over that, uh, right now it says that the input UV failed to collect any data. For some components, you'll notice the rectangle, we didn't fill in all of the inputs, uh, but that's because all of them come pre-filled in a component like this. Uh, in terms of the evaluate service component, nothing comes pre-filled. Um, so we'll just have to fill in the UV ourselves to complete this component. So what we'll add to this one is coming back to the uh, parameter. So the first tab in the toolbar at the top. Um, in the input, we have this component called a multi-dimensional slider. Um, so unlike the slider we added earlier that has one value from any range, the MD slider um, looks like a 2D plane and it'll give us a two-dimensional piece of data. So kind of like an XY coordinate. Uh, what we can use with the XY coordinate is to place a point onto this rectangle and we'll see that points will start populating once you plug it in. So 
Um, right now, we could either use one attractor point on the surface to make the pattern, or we could use two. In my case, um, for this workflow, I have two attractor points. I'm just going to copy and paste um, that multidimensional slider so we have two in the scene. So once you have two, um, we we'll want to plug both of these. These will create our points. We'll plug both of these into the UV. Um, and the UV specifically um, relates to surfaces. If you've ever done any other 3D work like texturing or something in a rendering software, you'll kind of understand what UV is. In this sense, U and V breaks down any um, surface. It has to be a surface into um, two coordinate scales. So you kind of, you have like the X and Y of a graph, but it's the U and the V um, is just the nomenclature of this. So if we um, answer the U and the V coordinate, we'll be able to place a point onto this um, surface here. So what I'll do is I'll plug this MD slider into UV. And you'll see that a point will populate in Rhino down at the very bottom left. So that's zero, zero um, of this grid on the plane. In order to plug the second in, I'll grab um, the output of the second MD slider. And what I'll want to do is also plug this into UV. But if I just plug it in, you'll see it'll get rid of the first wire. Um, so that's not all what we want to do. Um, if I have one plugged in, I'll do it again. I'm grabbing the second MD slider with the left mouse button. And if I hold shift while it's being dragged, you'll see that your little cursor, which might be hard to see on this screen, but it'll turn from a white arrow to a green arrow with a plus mark. And this means that you can add in inputs into the same input of the evaluate surface. So if I'm holding shift with the left mouse click, I can drop that into UV and it'll keep both wires in that UV input. So now what we can do, um, if we change one of the MD sliders, you'll see one of the points will be moving in Rhino. Right now, it's not moving very far. What I want it to do is when I'm at 0, 0, be in the bottom left of the rectangle. And then when I'm at 1, 1, it'll be in the top right of the rectangle. So we have the whole um, plane of the surface mapped out. What we can do, it's super easy to change this. Um, right now, we have a surface which has its own domain. And the domain is what we set with these two values. So um, the rectangle here on the x is 100 units long. But right now, this MD slider only goes from 0 to 1. So the points down here are not moving much. What we can do, and we can do this with surfaces and curves specifically, is to reparameterize the surface. What that'll do is it'll take the domain of the x and the y. So right now it's 0 to 100 and 0 to 54. And it'll map those numbers to a 0 and 1 value. So it'll take all that and put it down to 0 and 1. Um, so what we can do is we hover over the input of s here. And if we right click on this one, um, remember if we right click on the image in the middle, it'll give us like viewing options. If we right click on an input or an output, we get these other options here. Um, right now, we want to focus on this second section here, um, reverse to reparameterize. I kind of explained last class with um, how lists work in Grasshopper with what flatten and graph do. But right now, we'll be clicking reparameterize. Um, and now that you'll see the points will update in the scene. And we can go from the top right corner to the bottom left corner, even though the MD slider only goes from 0 to 1. So now we can place a point anywhere in this rectangular surface. I'm just going to place my two points kind of apart from each other. But is this working for everyone? Does anyone have any problems with setting this up? OK, so now that we have a surface with two points on it, um, what we can do is add the region of influence around each point that's going to affect our Voronoi pattern later on down the line. Um, so to do that, I'll take um, the two points from this evaluate surface. They're being output from the P component here. You'll see this will give us um, two locally defined values. And it's those two points at UV on the rectangle right there. Um, so we'll take those two and we'll just draw a circle around each one, and that'll be a range of influence for the pattern. So what we can do is click to search again. And if we type in circle, we'll get this orange. This is kind of all the orange components are like the basic parameters. So we'll get this orange circle out here. And all this one needs is 
um, a location and a radius. So we have the location, which are those two points from the evaluate surface. So if we take those two points, we'll plug them into C and we'll get two circles coming up on the screen. Right now, um, by default, they have a radius of one. So we can change that um, to be two different radii for both of the circles. So what we can do is um, grab two uh, value sliders again, and we'll use those value sliders to control the circle radii. So what we can do, instead of grabbing it from the input like we did last time, we'll do the searching method this time. And this one, the benefit of searching for a value slider, um, and you wouldn't type in value slider for this, but I'll show you what to do, is we can define the domain before we get the slider into the, into the scene right here. Um, so I want a value slider, say, 0 to 50 for this. So what I can do instead of searching for value slider or going and clicking it is I can type in 0, um, 2 periods, and then the upper bounds. So in my case, I want to do 50. So I have a domain of 0 to 50 here. So if I type it in like this, and there's a couple different ways that people know about Rhino to type in a number slider. You could use less than signs. You could use two dots like this. Um, but this is the simplest one. So 0 to 50, and if I hit Enter, a slider will populate the canvas and we'll be able to go from zero to 50. Right now, we just have integers. If you want to do decimals, um, then you can type in like 0, 0.00 dot dot 50, and then you'll get decimal places in between as well. But right now, we just have integers, which is fine. Um, we'll want to have two radii values, one for each of the circles. So I'll do the same thing I did for the multidimensional sliders, and I'll copy and paste um, the value slider here. So we have two of them. And then we'll do the same thing we did last time. So we plug one into radius, plug the other while holding shift um, into radius as well. And now if we edit these sliders, you can see we'll get two different size circles on the canvas and you can make these however big you want. Question. Mm -hmm. I don't know which one to which radius to assign to what point. Yeah, so in this one, it goes based on um, the order that you plug them in mm -hmm. to the radius. Um, in this case, though, that is a good question because it's not always clear. And sometimes, if you're working on a bigger script, that this might cause you trouble. Um, so, another thing you can do instead of doing this kind of hack method with putting two inputs in, um, we can get a component that's called merge. And this block is just for taking multiple inputs and converging them into one data stream. So if we grab that merge, it has two inputs. But if we zoom in here, we see we have like plus and minuses. We can add as many inputs as we like. So if we put into one and two, we'll have the same thing or these two numbers. And now we have the order. So we know what the order is. And we can plug that into radius. And it won't change. Um, but if we flip these, it will change. So. Um, the merge generally is a cleaner method of working, um, especially if you're showing or giving the script to other people so they understand like how the data is flowing is to use this. So I'll just keep that there. Up to you if you want to use one method or the other. Um, so what we'll do now with these two circles is we'll populate these with points. And the points are going to affect the Voronoi pattern um, later on. So with these two, we can populate these with either more or less points. And that'll make the pattern more or less dense. Um, in the final version. So um, the component for that would be populate, and it's populate geometry. There's three different options there. But right now, since we just have a flat um, flat circle, we'll use populate geometry. And um, what this will do is it'll take a surface and add a bunch of random points inside of that surface. So we can use that for density. So before getting to adding inputs to the populate geometry. If you put the circle in, it won't do what we need because we need um, points inside the circles. So just like when we did the boundary surface earlier, we can convert um, the basic curve. In this case, now it's circles to a surface that we can add those points onto. So I'll get another evaluate, or not evaluate, um, another boundary surface. And we'll just plug the two circles into that boundary surface. Um, you'll see the colors might be overlapping. So we now have surfaces inside of the circles that are inside of the rectangle. So we can use those two surfaces to now go into the geometry portion. 
And if we do that, we'll have these points coming up um, within both of the circles. So again, what we could do is, as it comes in, the populate geometry has 100 points per input. So if we wanted that to be different, which in this case, uh, we will want that, is what we can do is the same thing we did with the two radii for the circle. Um, you could create your own sliders or you could copy and paste. So we just have that coming again, and we can plug those in to the number, and we'll see the number here is the number of points to add. It's all set at 100 as it is, but if we plug an input um, with two different sliders, we'll have different points coming in. And then you can see with these two sliders, we can populate those two circles. Um, and if you just copy and paste it, the data will be flowing the same. So the first slider will affect the first circle on the first number of points, and the second slider will do the second circle um, and the second number of points here. So now we have the circles for the density, um, but we also want the circles for the entire rectangle um, itself. So the pattern will go across all of it. So what we can do um, is take what we just did, so the populate geometry, and we'll do that again for the surface of the rectangle. So another populate geometry. And we'll just take the output from the first boundary surface. So this is the boundary surface of the rectangle. It should show up green if you click on it. And we'll take that output from this boundary surface into the populate geometry that, that we just had. And this will give us points across the entire rectangle now. So one thing we could do, um, if we wanna make the data a little bit cleaner now, is you'll notice if we zoom in here, um, most of the points are relatively evenly scattered, but since we have now two different inputs of points, some of the points like this group here are very, very close together. Um, and this will affect the pattern because it'll try to place two um, cells, like curves of cells right next to each other, which might be what you want, but could be messy. Um, so what I'm gonna do is clean that up by testing um, the distance between every single point and culling or deleting the points that are too close together. So we'll set a number um, for what is considered too close, and we'll use that to find those points um, and take them away from the scene so we don't have a, a messy pattern at the end. So I might have said a lot, but it's just one component, which will cull duplicate points. Um, so we'll type in cull duplicate, and it'll be this red one with the X in the circle. No, did I crash someone's computer or is it? I don't know what it's doing. Okay. It's like fun. It's restarting. <laughs> yeah, always good to save your grasshopper scenes because if you do too much, it might just crash and you'll lose everything, which uh, is always a bummer. Um, okay, so with this cold duplicates component, you'll see that this one looks a little bit different than the rest of them because it has this word at the bottom average. Um, it's a rare thing, but some components and some components and other plugins will have this coming up at the bottom. If you right click on that word, you'll see it'll give you some options for what the component is gonna do. So right now um, with how it comes in is when it finds points that are too close, it'll find the average of those two points. So it'll kind of find the point in between. Question? Uh, what if your zoom tab that the, like the average one of them pop up? Do you have the cold duplicate component? Yeah. Uh, oh, you have? Try zooming in. Oh, never mind. Sorry. Yeah, thank you for that, yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's the thing um, with that and with the merge component that I showed too, a lot of the options for the components only show up if you zoom in. So sometimes you have to be pretty close to like see options for components. Um, yeah, so right now average finds the midpoint, call all will just take away, say those two points, it'll just delete both of them or leave one will randomly leave one or the other. Um, so in our case, it really doesn't matter what you pick. I would go with average or leave one, because um, if I delete everything, maybe I want one of the points to keep the pattern cohesive. Um, so I'm gonna leave it at average. 
And I'm going to plug in both of these populate geometries uh, to this input here. So this input wants the points, and then T wants the tolerance value. So this is the value that says, are the points too close or not? Um, right now, as it comes, it's 0.1. Um, and I'm just going to leave it like that at the moment. So before plugging the points into P right here, but you don't have to get this component out, but you'll notice if I plug um, the first populated geometry, so this is the one with the rectangle, uh, the output here is just a standard wire. Um, if I plug the output from the circles into this just to show, um, the wire is going to be dotted on this one. So the dotted wire versus a solid wire, um, that tells you something about how the data is formatted. Um, in this case, the data coming out of this populate component um, is grafted onto two different branches of this tree. So you'll see that if we hover over P, we have 0, 0 has 23 points, 0, 1 has 50 points. Um, and again, that's just the first circle has 23 points, the second circle um, has 50 points as we set. Yeah. What is the 36 in this? Oh, yeah. So it might not be on anyone else's screen, but there's a lot of options under display. I looked at draw icons, so we know if we want to draw icons or, um, or, or show the words. If we come all the way down to the bottom to Canvas widgets, there's more options here to show you info about your grasshopper scene. Right now, I have this one, Profiler, um, enabled. So what this one does, and I think it is that one. Yeah, it is. So what this one does is it shows you how long each component is taking to render on your machine. So right now, this populate geometry is taking 36 milliseconds to compute. Um, in some other scripts, like if it's loading forever and you don't know why, and then it finishes, you can come in and see like, oh, this one's taking 10 minutes to finish. I might want to like fix that section of the script. Um, it'll also automatically change the color of that little bubble. Um, so a lighter color is a quicker one and a darker color is a longer one. This one's the darkest that it goes. And that's only because this is the only one that's taking any significant amount of time to calculate. So in our scene currently, this is the longest thing happening. So it's like a red bubble, even though it's only 36 milliseconds, which isn't a lot. Um, yeah, so going back to the data type. So with this one with the dotted line, so as last class, I pulled out panels a lot just to look at data. But if we pull out this panel, and make it a lot bigger, you'll see that we have one set of 0, 0, and another set with this dark header of 0, 1. So we kind of have two groups of data. Whereas the other one, since it's only one rectangle, will only have one group of data. And it won't show us the 0, 0, 0, 1. Like in this case, since there's only one branch, it'll just show us everything that's in that branch. I do the panel again. Yeah, so this yellow one, if you come in, it's also an input, that yellow one, but if you're searching, it'll just be two forward slashes. So if you type in just two forward slashes and click enter, you'll get that panel. And you can resize it to be whatever size you want to show as much data, and it should have a scroll bar as well. Is everyone good on that? Yeah. How would you disconnect the wire if you wanted to do that? Yeah, so what you can do, um, and I'm just going to make sure. Okay. So if you want to disconnect a wire, there's two different ways to do it. Well, in my case, there's three, but I have a plugin. So don't worry about that. Um, but if you want to disconnect, what you can do is you can click on um, the final component. So in this case, that little data block, you can click on that. And if you come down to disconnect, you can see that we have a single option for the single thing connected to it. So we right click and we can hit disconnect the populate geometry. So that'll, that'll take it away. Um, but that method is kind of slow, like clicking through all the menus. The other thing you can do is if it's plugged in like this, um, we can hold down control and you'll see that that little arrow will be red if we hold down control on the keyboard. And we hold down control left click and just go backwards. So go from data to populate geometry and that'll disconnect the wire and take it off. Yeah. Okay, is everyone good on that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, the next thing, so I just pulled that data block up just to show the different wires and the different wire types before we plug it into cold duplicates. Um, you always wanna be careful if you have things with dotted wires and things without, 
we don't have a lot of data currently. There's only like um, like a hundred values, which isn't a lot for the computer. But if you had thousands of values, you, you were comparing against each other, plugging in something with multiple branches and things with one branch could really slow down your computer. Um, so before plugging it in, since I know that that might happen, um, and since I don't really need the data to be like diversified like this into two different branches, what we can do is flatten all those branches into one single list. So we just have a list with all the points in it. Um, we don't have three different lists with different points. So what we can do is with the cold duplicates, if we right click on the points, we can come down here to flatten. And what that'll do is it'll say whatever data is coming in to that specific input is going to all be compressed into a single list with a bunch of different values on it. In this case, they're points. So now we can plug in both geometries. Um, it'll still show a dotted line coming out of populate geometry. But just to show if something's flattened, you can come into it with dotted and it'll output it as a single branch just to show that this is what's happening in a flattened. Um, so we have that one plugged in and we can also, again, holding shift, plug the other point in. So now we should have both populates going into the cold duplicates. And technically you don't need this data block since it is flattened. Um, we could plug in just both to the cold duplicates. It'll do the same thing. Okay, so it looks like our um, tolerance here, point 0.1, is too small for something like this. So I can just grab a slider again um, and pull that out, and we can define the range. Um, in this case, since we want to be pretty small, I'll start with a decimal like 0 0.001, just something pretty small. And also to give us um, decimal values, I'll do the two dots and our upper bound can be whatever number you want. Okay, so plugging that into the tolerance, I'll just slide it up until I see the problem areas go away. So you'll see that point that has two points right there. Once we get to a big enough number, they'll converge in the middle to the average. So we'll just slide it right around there, whatever seems good. Um, so you get, there's a, we can see there's a, maybe three problem spots where points were a little bit too close and this just cleaned it up. Everyone good on that? Okay. So one thing I'll do now, since we have a lot of different things showing in Rhino is I'm just gonna turn off the preview for everything before the thing we just did. Um, so I don't see points on top of other points. So what I can do is just drag over everything and we can right click off in the canvas somewhere this time. Um, if we click on a component, it won't give us this the options for everything. So I'll select everything and click off to the side. And now we can preview off everything there. And now in Rhino, we're only left with seeing the whole grouping of points that we have. Okay, so now that we have these points, uh, we're getting down to the portion where we can plug in a really nice component called Voronoi and we'll get the pattern coming through right here. So, Yeah, if I'm correct, the component we're looking for, um, all the Voronoi operations happen under the mesh tab and then the triangulation tab, or you could type in Voronoi, um, but it'll be this little triangle with red, green, and blue colors in it right here. Really quick, were you clicking mm -hmm. the preview off for that when you Yes, it? yeah. Should you still get a list of points? I just have the cold duplicates on, and you'll notice too, when you preview something off, the component itself will be gray and everything we see is gonna be white. So I can like preview on both of these and they'll come back to like a light gray color and we can see it in Rhino. Okay. And then if I was to select both of those components again, right click off to the side, oh, preview off, they'll go away, it'll turn a darker gray. So we just have those points, yeah. Okay, so now with the Voronoi, um, it has a couple inputs here, it needs points. Um, it needs optional cell radii, optional. We don't need that. It needs a boundary region um, and an optional plane. 
So the thing, two things I'm going to fulfill, which we already have, are the grouping of points for the diagram um, and the boundary um, rectangle for this scene. So we'll take that original surface again, so that boundary surface. Um, and we'll be putting the output of the boundary surface into the input for this Voronoi. Um, it might be hard to see since we've zoomed out so far, and in your laptops too, it might be hard to see back and forth. Um, what we can do is there's a nice component that does nothing um, called relay. And if we get this relay, this is just like a placeholder component. It does nothing. But what's nice about it is we can um, take the output of our boundary surface into the relay, and we can grab this component and we can drag this with us to wherever else we want and the inputs will follow. So what we can do now is we can left click to grab this component and you can't really scroll to move around, but you can scroll to zoom out. So one thing we can do, um, this is the one like thing I don't like about Grasshopper too much is like moving while you have wires in a big scene, but this is the easiest way to do it. So we can grab the relay and while we're grabbing it, we can zoom out, we can point at the Voronoi and we can zoom back in. And then the relay component should follow us and we can have it down here next to the Voronoi. We can also rename it if you want. So if you right click on that, it has a little white space above enabled and we can just type in whatever we want to just give that a name so we know what, uh, data we have coming along with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you if you get a number slider into your scene, you can either grab it from the inputs section um, in Grasshopper in the parameters, or you can type in a number dot dot another number to get that tolerance value. Um, it's important. For, well, yeah, important for this one to have decimal places because we want the tolerance to be quite small. And if we had integers, it would get big pretty fast. So um, I'm just in between uh, one and two right here is a good range for what I see. How do you rename uh, the relays again? Yeah, so if you right click on the relay, it'll be a little blank white space right above enabled. Yeah, and if you just click on it, the little box will pop up and you can type in whatever you want there. Yeah. Okay, so we can plug that base rectangle surface into the option for boundary. So that'll tell the Voronoi pattern to not go bigger than the rectangle. And then we can take the points um, from the cold duplicates component and plug that into the P for the Voronoi component. And we'll see the pattern will now populate the screen and we'll have an outline around all the points. Okay, everyone able to get to this step? Good. Okay, and the last thing we'll do for this, just to get it to individual cells around each circle, um, is just to clean up how these outline cells are shaped. So you'll see right here, we have a list of 169 polyline curves. So that means there's one curve around each point. Um, just to show, this isn't part of the workflow, but one way to see kind of what that individual cell looks like is with this list item component. And if we're under um, sets, we have this whole option for how we want to um, affect and manipulate lists. Uh, I talked about this a little bit last class with controlling how data flows in Grasshopper. Um, but just to show this is like the most basic one of the bunch right here is what this list item will do is it'll show us um, a single item in a list. So right now we have all of these cells around the points. So if we plug all those cells into the list that we want to operate on, so that's the L here, we can define um, any index value and that'll show us the corresponding cell in the scene. Uh, you'll see with this list item as it comes in, it already has zero populated in the item index category. 
And if we click on this, we'll see that we have a single cell showing up right now. Mine's in the little left side over there. Um, yours could be somewhere else. All of our patterns will be different. Um, but what we can do is if we get a slider that goes between, it could be whatever range you want it to be. Right now I'm doing um, zero to 168, which will be all 169 inputs I have here. So I have a slider that goes all the way up. Um, so if we plug this instead of zero into the I for index um, and click on the list item, now that we can see, we can um, select individual cells out of, those, out of this list. And we'll see that each cell that it says in the Voronoi category, this is what it looks like in the scene. So it's a fully closed loop around each one of the points. So what we can do with this to finish up this workflow for the 2D Voronoi is just smooth out the edges so we get kind of a, a smoother cell around each one and, and separate them all from each other so they're not overlapping. Um, really easy here we can do is under the curve component category, um, there's utilities here that we can use to affect how a curve looks. And specifically in this bottom section, we have these options here, um, like converting curves to polylines, simplifying uh, the control points in a curve, rebuilding curves, reducing them, smoothing them, all this stuff. What I'm going to use right now is the rebuild and the smooth components. And what this will do is it'll take our cell that we have here, rebuild the control points. So all of them are consistent with the control points. So we get a consistent smoothing. And then we'll use the smooth component to round out all those edges. So the first thing I'll bring in is the rebuild. And what we can do here is it's asking for under the C component, the curves that we want to rebuild. So we can take the curves from the Voronoi cells, all these polyline curves here, and plug those cells into the curve of the rebuild. You can see it as it comes, we have a count of 10. You could change this. And just to show, as we go down to the lower numbers, the curves will get decimated more and more until it becomes the simplest curve it can be, which is a triangle. If it was any less, it'd be a line. So the more we go up in the values here, the closer it'll get back to the original input. So a lower number will kind of break that curve down into less control points. And we looked at this a little bit in the very beginning of last class with the curves in Rhino and how you can set points and a curve will be drawn in between. Um, these curve points are basically, if I have five, there's going to be five points for every polygon line. And then that line will go from one point to the other. And you see we're, we're drawing a lot of pentagons now. Every single one has five points. So I'm going to keep mine at 10. You can add whatever number you want for what looks best for you. Um, but the last step here would be just to smooth this out and round off all those edges. So we have, again, out of the rebuild curve, we have still 169 curves. And the smooth polyline component is asking for the polylines that we want to smooth. So we can just plug in all of those into the P here. And now we'll see it's added more points and it's also smoothed out the transition between the original control points. So again, with the preview, I can select everything before this, preview it off, um, and we're left with the smooth cells around every point. So was everyone able to get to this step or is anyone having trouble? Okay, so that's that's that for the 2D component. And I'll just show, um, you can do this as well with your scene, but I'll show up here as well. Um, the main thing with computational design or, or coding in this aspect is now that we've done all this work to get to this step, we have the final geometric output. Um, we're not stuck with this image. We can go back to the very beginning of the script with where we added those multidimensional and number sliders. And if we change those numbers, will change how the scene uh, in Rhino looks. So we can move those attractor points around and we'll see that the density of points is following. 
um, the points that I'm moving, and we can collide them into each other. And since we have that cold duplicates component, any of the points that are coming into close contact are being deleted out, so we don't have any really weird small cells. And then we can also control the size of each of those control points and also the density as well. So we can add a lot more, maybe in a really small section. Or we could make some of the sliders, go back and edit them, make their domains a lot bigger, and we could add a lot more points in this section. So we still have full control over the scene here. Um, I guess back to Susan's question earlier, I added a lot more points to the second circle. So it's super dense now. And you can see now it's taking 93 milliseconds to do each calculation. So it's still not a long time, but it might feel a little more jittery as you're moving around the inputs than it did with less points. Yeah, yeah. Is there a way to they come smoother on the hmm. Yeah, so yeah, Susan mentioned that's a good question and, and it touches on the data types as well. So right now this is a polyline. Yeah. Um, a curve is different than a polyline, although a polyline is a curve. Or some okay. yeah, some way around like one is the same and if you go backwards it doesn't work. Oh. Um, but a curve or a polyline can be a curve because it is a line. Um, that that goes around on the on the screen. Uh, a curve, um, in my sense, would be something that looks a lot smoother than this. This still has, um, like the kinks where the lines come together. It has those hard points on it. If we want to smooth it out and do a final actual like smooth circle, like a mathematically perfect curve, um, in Grasshopper we can use a component called interpolate, and what that'll do is it's very similar to the curve component we looked at in the very beginning of last class with the Rhino tutorial. Like we can draw an interpolated curve in, in Rhino and each, this only has um, those four or five control points, but it is a super smooth curve. So we can do the same thing in Grasshopper. We can take those control points and make an interpolated curve. Um, so in this sense, we have a button for going from um, curve to a polyline. Uh, because we can uh, go down the steps of detail to something less detailed. Um, but stepping up, we'll have to add uh, one more component, and that'll just be in the analysis section of the curves. Uh, we can analyze each polyline and figure out where the points, the control points of each polyline is. Um, that component would be a discontinuity. Um, and this is going to check for anywhere where the curve comes to a hard point. Um, I feel like this term is very similar to um, like trigonometry as well. Like if you have graphs, like the point where it comes to a single spot and it's not smooth anymore. So if we pull out the discontinuity component, we can plug the smooth polylines, the P, into the curve of the input of discontinuity. And this will populate each curve with a point at the, at the spot where it comes to a hard point. So now that we have that, you'll notice too, if we bring up a panel again, we now have these dark uh, banners at the top. So, and we have a dotted line connecting it. So we know that um, now we have, looks like 300 or 3,034 uh, branches in this tree. So like each curve has uh, say like 10 points on it, 10 to nine points and each of those 10 to nine points have been put in their own group that corresponds to each one of the circles. Um, so if they were all flattened onto a list, we would just have a jumble of a thousand so points and we wouldn't be able to get back to smooth circles of each one. But since they're all in different uh, branches on this list, since we have uh, zero to 303 branches, each one still has those 10 points contained in itself. Um, I could show what it looks like if we just had all the points scattered in a single list, it would be chaos on the screen. But since we have all those points in each uh, little section, we can bring in a component called interpolate. And interpolate, it should look like how it is. It's points with a smooth line going in between it. And with interpolate, 
Um, it's asking for the points to interpolate between. We have those points from discontinuity. If we plug those in to interpolate, uh, we can turn off the previews of everything else, and we're left with uh, mathematically perfectly smooth curves right here. If you do this, you'll notice that all the curves are not closed. They have an opening on each side, um, and that's kind of where the seam was um, in the polylines to begin with. That's just a setting in the interpolate. Um, there's a setting here called periodic. Uh, it's a Boolean toggle value, so it's either false or true. False means it's not periodic, so it doesn't complete the full loop. Um, but we can right click on this P and we can go down to set Boolean and we can flip that Boolean value. So if we go to true, it'll complete the uh, circular nature of it and it'll actually complete the full thing. And you should get curves that are now periodic or closed, however you want to refer to it. Um, so we can go into that component, right click and set it. Or we can grab actually a Boolean toggle, which is also in the parameters input section, or we can search for it as a toggle. And what this will give us is a button on the canvas that we can double click and change the state of this button. So double click, false, double click, true. There's another component that works very similar, which is a button. Um, this one, the state is not set. So if you, you can see, it's always false unless you press it, and it's true only for the duration of you clicking the button. Uh, we don't want to use this in this sense because it'll automatically go back to false all the time. So we'll use the toggle so it stays in one state. We can plug that into periodic, and now we have a button on the canvas that we can see rather than going into the component and changing the value. It takes a couple more steps that way. So now we can just double click and change the state of the curves. And you'll notice now as we're doing um, these other actions that are a little bit more complex than the things we were doing before, um, that profiler from the Canvas widgets is now showing us that we're taking a few more milliseconds uh, per component as we're doing more and more. But we still have full control of these curves. It's just a little bit less smooth now, more jagged as it updates. Mm -hmm. Does the um, little message bubble tell you what's wrong? Huh. Interesting. Um, it could be it, it could be that you have two points on top of each other. I don't know why I would do that. Um, it shouldn't if everything's set up correctly, but if there's like two points where the connection would be infinitely small between them, then it's just going to skip over it. Um, so in this case, it, it still works at least, yeah. but you might have that that little tiny error coming up, I would have to assume. Or there could be something else going on, but... Can you go back to the Voronoi node? Yeah. Okay. Mine's doing, yeah, I can show it to you. Mine, mine seems to be, it's just the circle seems to be using the outside for the. So, there. so yeah, so um, what it's doing is it's taking the Voronoi for each branch in the list, mm -hmm. which because you have the thought of line here. If you flatten that P, so all the data coming in is flattened into a single list of points, mm -hmm. that error should go away. Um, and I guess actually to Susan and um, the, the question of what, what was your name? Danielle. Danielle. So yeah, your question. What do you have a tolerance value on this? Yes. What's it set at? Uh, now it's at two point one. Okay. Yeah, I, I was thinking if it was super small, you might have the issue where you would have an infinitely small um, cell for the Voronoi, but yours is very big, so I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. But at least it's still working. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The end.
Interpolate component is one of the only ones where it can be solid red but still work. Okay. So yeah, you're lucky on that one. Does that happen for anyone else that you're getting any red anywhere? Okay. On the Voronoi? Yeah. 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 <clears throat> okay. Yeah, the interpolate product has split. That is, but yeah, so um, same same thing that, that just happened. So what this one's doing is it's trying to make a Voronoi pattern for each branch in the list. So right now, if you remember the routine, you'll see that um, we have those two sets. One of them has 104, one of them has 100. Um, so what we want to do is combine all those points into a single list. So we're doing only one Voronoi operation. Right now, you're doing two Voronoi operations, and we're getting that error. So what you want to do is on that key right there, if you right click on this screen, yep, so the input, and we just flatter it with input. All those points will go into a single list. It will be one operation, and then you won't get any red. The other reason we're getting red is because your second input has zero points in it. And you can't do a Voronoi operation if you have no points to work with. So I think that's just that slide over there. Um, just doing that. And then, you know, what's the bubble say? Mm -hmm. So if you click on the component right to the left of it, yeah. And if you preview that one on. Yeah. Yeah, so it has, it has points. So you're getting issues. Um, hover over the input of the Yeah, I wonder if you have a set that has um, zero points to it, and it would be giving you um, an issue because there's no points. Um, I'll go back on this screen just to show, but I wonder what you can do is. Um, Well, we could test for if any list in the whole branch or in the tree has no um, values in it. So if we get this com component called list length, what that'll do is if we plug it in, it'll show us um, how many, uh, in this case, points are contained inside each list. I have a lot of tens and nines, um, but if you have one that has zero points in it, uh, that might be giving you an issue because there would be insufficient points to draw a curve. So um, in this case, I don't know if you're going to see it because you might have a lot of values there. It'd be hard to like look through it all yourself. Um, what we can do is test to see if any branch is equal to zero, which means it would have no points, which means you couldn't make a curve out of it. Um, so if we hit the equal sign, we can get this component called equality. And this is going to be a testing two values against each other. So we have the numbers of the list length. And we can, if we make a panel, um, and I, yeah, I didn't explain this yet, but you can get a panel by clicking two forward dashes and you'll get the panel and you can plug in zero. So we want to test to see if any list has zero in it. Um, or just like the number slider, you can define that before hitting enter. So you could do the two forward slashes, um, add zero, hit enter, and you'll get a panel again that has zero populated already. So two, two different ways to do that. Um, but I can plug that into B, and now it'll be testing whether or not my list has zero points in it. And that'll give us a Boolean value again, so either a true or a false. And these have taken the place of the count numbers. So I don't have any zeros, so I get a lot of falses. Um, but you might be getting a true. It's still a really big list. So what we can do now is grab a component that'll delete if it's true. Um, so we can grab this component called call pattern. And since we have a pattern of true false variables, and we can use this pattern to, to delete it if it is true. Um, so with this, we can plug in the Boolean output from equality. So testing if A is equal to B, we'll plug that into the pattern of those true false values.
Is that flowing so far? Okay. And then with this, now that we know we have all the, the pattern here, so we know which one we want to delete. Um, and since we haven't done any flattening or grafting uh, options on this stream so far, um, this list with all of the points for each cell um, correspond to the true false values coming into the pattern here. So what we can do is take the output from discontinuity into the input um, for the list of data into the L for the coal pattern. And then anywhere where it's, in this case, it's it'll delete if it's false. Um, so one thing we can do for this, um, which I do a lot for Boolean values, is we only want to delete the ones that have nothing in it. Right now, it's showing because nothing's green in the rhino scene. You see, I have points, and now nothing's showing up. Um, what I can do is come down to P, and what we want to do is invert this. So if it's true, if it's equal to zero, it will delete um, that list of points that has nothing in it. Why did my output of the equality parameter just come up with false? Thank just you. one false? Yeah. It is a negative. It's... Yeah, I mean, the list should be dotted line. It should be all the different branches. Just one. <laughs> you, are you okay. only... okay. Yeah, so you have a solid line coming out of... Oh, because you went into a list um, a list item. Oh. Okay. First, so you're just selecting item 42. Yeah. Um, so you only have one cell going into that. Okay. I'm pulling um, from discontinuity okay. itself. So this is the tree of all of the branches of the lists of points. Will you describe flattening things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I can do it with this one pretty simply. Um, I'll bring out two panels here. So we have one where each piece of data is on its own list or its own its own branch. So branch zero 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 zero. Um, is false. Branch 01 is false. Um, if I was to flatten the data, so, so I can either right click, scroll down, hit flatten, or there is also a flatten component. They do the same thing. Um, if I was to plug this in, you'll see it's all going now to a single zero, and it has all of those data as one continuous list. So this is important because in Grasshopper, if you're doing operations on things, um, and in the recording for last class too, I went over this a little bit with that ladder um, that I was building. Right. So with this list that has one piece of data on every separate branch, um, if we were to plug these together into say like a loft, if we wanted to loft two lines together, um, it would only look at what's inside every single branch. So in this case, since there's you know, if we were to think of this as curves, if there was one curve, we can't loft. We need a loft from a start to an end. So if there was one, it wouldn't do anything. Um, in this case, if they're all together, now it can go from zero to one to two to three, mm -hmm. put in the whole list. Um, this one, they're all contained in their own separate thing. Um, so it's just uh, kind of breaking the data apart. Uh, and in our case, that's um, important here because if I was to, um, Flat, that's not flatten. If I was to flatten the points coming out of this, um, yeah, I might want to save here. Okay, so if I was to flatten all these points, so now instead of there being 10 points in a little group for that like single mm -hmm. boundary curve, now they're all in a single list with 3000 uh, variables. Mm -hmm. um, now, when they're on their own lists, I get those curves that stick within the points, but now if all the points are on their own list, we plug it in. Um, now it doesn't know like where next to go and it goes sure. through everything. They're not grouped in that right. same way. Yeah, yeah. So we get this like web of, of curves instead of a clean um, keeping those circles intact. Yeah. So hopefully that kind of helps a little bit. Yeah. The like lists in Grasshopper do take a while to figure out like how Grasshopper is thinking and how it's doing what it does. Mm -hmm. um, if you've been in coding before, that might be a little bit easier to understand. If you haven't, it, it takes a little bit to like 
understand why this is all working as it is. Mm -hmm. but hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, yeah, so back to your question, this should all be done. So now um, we should have deleted anything that had zero points in it. And then if we plug that into interpolate, um, does that get rid of the problem? Are you still getting a red? Yep. Orange. Okay, orange is better than red. Yeah, so there's not showing up in the. Oh, yeah, so there is one. Or so, I, yeah, I, I had a good punch. Um, so, we need to put the L first. So, if you zoom out a little bit. So right now we have the, the pattern of what to delete, but L is going to be the list that we will be deleting stuff from. So if it's not filled in, we won't have them do it. Mm -hmm. from. So we do that a little bit, and it should be right, um, right near this one is all the points. Mm -hmm. So if we plug that P mm -hmm. into L, yep, this P into that L. So now we have the list, and we have the pattern of what to delete. So we plug that in, it'll delete the one that has nothing in it. And now if you plug the L, the list coming out of that into the V for the values of interpolating. So this L and just replace it with that V. Um, it should have gotten rid of the one that had nothing in it. I mean, you're still getting curves coming up. Yeah. So we have two of the same issue. Um, we solved one of them. I don't know why it's still red. Does the bubble say anything? Yeah, so if you click on the bubble right there, it'll have red pop up. So, I mean, we got rid of the one that had nothing in it. Um, I mean, it is working. Interpolate is working. We are getting the curves in right now. So other than that, the only other thing that might be happening is there's points like on top of each other in a list. Well, yeah, they'd have to be like so on top that they're literally just like the same values and then it wouldn't know like how to connect two points that have zero distance between each other, but um, that's an issue that I have a plugin to solve, but we haven't gotten to that point yet, so it's working yeah. right now, um, but we'll get into in a couple of classes from now, like how to delete um, points or lines that are on top of each other that could be corrupting um, the workflow going on. Um, any other questions, Thorne, if you have something? Yeah, I can get your mind. Okay, do you have some? Could you um, take a look at my Yeah, yeah, I'll take a look at Which Which one is it? Yeah, it's all of them. Okay, could you zoom in a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you have a little bit of a little bit of a little so what does the bubble say on the bubble or error? So that little red bubble that I think he was just yeah, so no. Yeah, that's a that's a funny one with the data that as well. It it thinks your zero is the header <laughs> instead of an upper. Um that's really fine. All you want to do is double click on the scatter. So put it below it so you could actually work on that. Just type in integer and just yeah, grab that so, the, so plug the zero into that. Yes, and then plug that into the so it solved it. And yeah, it's weird. Um, we just converted it from whatever it was. It works. It's red, but it works. I don't know why it's doing that. Yeah, so if you click on the table, what is that? So it's the same thing, but if you click on the table, like a little thing. So what are yeah, it's really too red, but it's working because it's full responding. Um, for some reason, Grasshopper thinks the zero is actually a text value, not a number. I don't know why it does that. If we, if we had a slider here, like a slider that had zero, it would be fine with the way the panels it could be misconstruing what we want. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, in your case, you shouldn't have said oh, that. You have. Did you ever know this? So that's what we write both on that. You're still going to write it. So not the not the L. So right now I think I think it's the checking for it's doing it's good. Yeah. So what it's doing is it deleted everything. Okay. Because you had nothing that was zero because that the original one was working yeah. fine. I did the rest of this just to help her out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but in your case, you had no problems. So what we did here is if you zoom into the, the poll add um, what it's doing is since the equality says that everything is false, what that component does is it deletes falses, false that we could say. So what I have done is if you right click on the P right there, um, there's an option called invert. It will just turn everything from false to true. So we keep everything that we want to. Um, okay, so click on what's that list point? You know what that was on? This one? The list point? The cherries or something? Um, maybe there's one of those weeks. It's actually this continuity. Uh, well, maybe right. we might be solving the problem we didn't have with this. Mm -hmm. Because it was working before. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 For a lot of the stuff, a lot of Grasshopper components and Grasshopper Rhino is helpful to say um, for Windows operating systems. Oh, you. So you might run into issues with yeah. that too, like running on a Mac yeah. could be problematic. Yeah. But, um, I, I bought a Windows security fix. Yeah. 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 You can run it on a, on a Mac, but some things you might have some more issues, but we'll get to those once if they come up. So, um, yeah. For now, you look good. What's the question of the list length? Um, after the discontinuity, yeah. is what's, it, the, what's the purpose of that? Yeah, so what I did to help her out is um, I had a hypothesis that she had a curve in there that was infinitely small, um, which when we broke it down into the discontinuity, it found zero points for that curve. And you can't then make an interpolated curve out of nothing. Right. So what I wanted to do is test to see if we had any um, uh, branches in the tree that had nothing in it. So the list length looked at everything and it said if um, with the equality, if this branch had no data in it, we just want to remove that branch. So we can take the issue away. Um, so the list length was saying it just measures everything. In my case, um, I had a lot of values. It said the curve had 10 points to it, had nine points to it. But if there's one that had zero points, then we can test that inequality. So if the list is zero. Um, we can find that anyone that is zero, set that to true, and then delete any of the true um, values. Gotcha. Yeah. So the list link is just finding um, <coughs> how many pieces of data are in the list. So it's basically doing like if you hover over P, we can see the numbers 10, but in order to get that value out, we need list link to get that 10. So we can see it hovering over, but we can't use it unless we have this other component to actually grab that number for us. Okay, so everyone's going to put a 2D one. Yeah. We'll, we'll quickly do the, the 3D one just to show the difference between a 2D Voronoi and a 3D Voronoi. Um, I had a tractor points plan for that too. It works in the exact same way. I'm just going to take out that section for time. Um, so we'll see a 3D Voronoi, uh, but we just won't see the density. We can still change like how the points are distributed and everything. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and preview off everything that we did in that first one. And we'll start on uh, the next one, 
which we'll use a lot of what we learned from this one and just apply it in a 3D sense. And this will take a lot less components. So uh, the first thing here, again, we have to set that boundary question. Oh, wait, where did you? Yeah, so if you just uh, select everything in the scene, I just dragged over a box over everything I have. And then if you right click anywhere, that's not a component. So I just right click off to the side. And then there should be the second option is preview off, like a little blindfold. Yeah, it'll just turn everything in your scene off. So we don't uh, disrupt what we're, what we're looking at now. Okay, so I'm just coming below that. You can make a new document as well if you wanted to, but I'm just coming below everything. Um, and in this sense, we want to do a 3D rectangle. So that's just a box um, or a cube. In this case, the term is box in Grasshopper. Uh, we can grab a center box. We could also grab a two-point box, but the center box is just the easiest one to work with. It'll make a box around the origin point of Rhino. So again, we have the base plane, the XY, and we have the domain boundaries of it. So we have XY, and now we have a Z for the height component. So we can change these again if we want with uh, number sliders. I'm just gonna do a one to 20. You can do whatever range you want, as big as you or small as you want the boxes. I'm gonna make three of them, one for each of the values for this box. Sorry, well, real quick, when I right when I right click and select things and I right click, it seems like it's deselecting them when I control click. Uh, I'm trying to turn the preview off. Uh, yeah. But if you select it all and then right click. Can you right click on the track then? That's what you can do. Yeah, so you get the natural people. So you get the grass until it clicks on the thing or feels like it's clicking. Okay. And then I'll go, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I'm renting it back for the first time. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think. There, there is another way to do it, but it's probably even more difficult for you with the trackpad. But if you click down on the mouse wheel, you get this little hotkey menu that pops up, which also has the option. But I think that's impossible on a trackpad. So right click is your, is your best bet right now. Yeah, I never use this menu anyway. I always right click. It's a little bit quicker, I guess. I don't know. OK, so yeah, with the center box, we can plug in the values. And you've probably already done this, but we can make this box as big as we want in the scene. Doesn't matter how big it is. Okay, so last time we set up all the other stuff to control like where the points are going to be. Um, in this case, uh, we can get rid of all that if we want to keep it simple. Uh, and instead of populate geometry, there's those other two options right there. In our case, we want a 3D box, so we'll just populate 3D. And this will do the same thing populate geometry does, but now with a 3D boundary. So you see as it comes in, it already has inputs to it, but they're not what we want. Uh, so we can plug that box into the region for the populate 3D. And I guess one thing I'll mention, like sometimes the outputs and the inputs aren't gonna have the same letter on them, like B goes to R. If you hover over, it'll be a little more clear. You know, we have a box and this just wants a region. So some words mean the same thing. So it's always good to hover over and check. Hey, yeah, it's a, for for this one or for the two one. Oh yes, uh, so the X um, in Rhino from Grasshopper means that there's a point right there. So I'm assuming that's like the point of the plane. Right now, for your box, you have decimal values of point two five, so it's probably like just super small. Um, so you can type a bigger value. I don't know if it'll change though. What you can do first is if you right click on the slider um, beforehand, you can go to the value, so right click, then you can go to the value drop down. So right in the middle of the value on the slider. And then scroll over there. If you go to the mask, 
Okay, so we've got a box with points in it. Everyone, yeah? Cool. Um, okay, next thing we can do, we have these two. Um, super easy if we don't have an attractor point in the sense. I'll do something interesting at the end, but in this case, we have everything defined um, for the 3D uh, Voronoi. So I can type Voronoi again. We have this 3D one now. It's kind of like these blue cells stacked up. All this one needs is the points for the diagram and the boundary region um, for the diagram as well. So we have those two values we can plug them in. A thing I'll mention is with the boundary, you can make the boundary smaller than the list of points you have. You can make the boundary bigger than the list of points you have, and it'll just affect the cells and the sizes of them on that outer edge. Um, if you make the box bigger, you'll have some cells stretched out. If they get smaller, you'll get rid of some on the outsides. But um, right now we have the center box and the points corresponding to each other exactly. So I'll just plug the points in and I'll plug the boundary in as well. So previewing off everything else, we can see we have this transparent group of cells inside the box. So right now it's kind of cool. Um, it's kind of useless stuck inside the region. Uh, what I'm going to do is using a curve in Rhino, we'll edit it in Rhino, we'll be able to select um, certain cells out of the box. So we um, kind of have a, a pipe of cells following along with what we're doing in Rhino. Um, so the, the way we'll do this is we'll have a curve and we have all of the cells. In this case, there are 100 um, cells inside this region. We can use a curve to select the cells closest to that curve. Uh, so the first thing I'll do is if we grab a curve parameter uh, in Grasshopper, what this one does is this is just an input for something from Rhino. Uh, if it's this black little icon, there's a lot of them in the parameters section. This is just a holder for some Rhino data type. So what we can do in Rhino is draw the curve in the scene. So we can draw whatever curve we want. I'm just going to draw something like this. Doesn't have to be complicated. Um, but I'm just using uh, this button up here where we can draw a curve with a couple points. And when you're drawing, you can left click to place a point. And then once you're done placing all the points, just hit enter uh, and it'll finalize the curve. We also have the command line up top that'll tell you what's coming up. So while you're drawing, um, it'll say next point and then press enter when done. We can see like up there, it's kind of telling us what it wants. Press enter when done. So with the curve in Rhino, anyone having issues using Rhino to add a curve? Okay, so if we have the curve we want in the scene, um, now we want to to pair this this curve up from Rhino, we want to add that into Grasshopper so Grasshopper knows that this curve exists. So we have this little parameter right here that'll hold a curve. So what we can do with everything deselected, just to make it easy, um, is we can right click on this curve component. And we have these options now here specific to this type of parameter is we can set um, pieces of data inside of this component. So right now, since I have one, I can set one curve. So if we click on this, Grasshopper will minimize itself for a second. And we'll see in Rhino, it's asking me up in the command line to select a curve or edges to reference into Grasshopper. So since I selected, I want to set one curve. As soon as I left click on this curve, 
Grasshopper will pop back up. And we'll see now um, if we click on the component in here, it'll show up as green in Rhino. So we know that we have it selected. It's also white and there's no errors. So we know that we have a curve selected. So now we have the curve from Rhino uh, instantiated in the Grasshopper. So we know that uh, this curve is this curve and we can now use it in Grasshopper to do different things. And one thing I'll mention with this is if we were to save Grasshopper at this point and close out Grasshopper, close out Rhino, if we open the software back up again, um, this curve will now be empty because the curve is in Rhino itself. Uh, you'll have to save a Rhino file as well as a Grasshopper file and open both of those at the same time to make sure you can grab the curves or points, whatever you have in Rhino, back in your Grasshopper document. Just one thing to be careful of uh, when you're doing a workflow like this. Um, so with this curve, um, what we can do is use this to find cells that are close to the curve. Um, so an easy way to do that is to divide the curve up into points, test the distance between the point and the center point of a cell, and find the ones that are closest based on some kind of range value that we set. So just a couple of components here to do that. The first one is dividing the curve into points. One way we can do that is with divide curve, a component in the curve section. Uh, so with this, it has a couple inputs. It has the curve, the number of points, and the not type, um, or the, the kink. So this one's optional. Uh, what we want to focus on is the curve and the number. Right now, it's set at 10, which is fine. Uh, we can plug the curve in to see. And when we do that, we should see the points being populated evenly spaced um, onto the curve in Rhino right here. So with these points now, we can uh, test the distance between all the cells and delete all the ones that are too far away from the curve. So in order to do that, we'll need the center point of uh, the voxels right here. And we have those from earlier. The populate 3D corresponds exactly to the Voronoi. So we could use those points uh, in our test. So the first thing to do is we don't want to test the distance between every point on the curve and every point in the Voronoi 3D diagram. Now we only want to test the distance between um, a single point on a curve and a single point uh, in the Voronoi diagram. And one way to do that is to first find the closest point um, between the cells in the diagram and the curve. So we first figure out what point is closest and then measure that distance. Um, and this will make things a little bit cleaner than just measuring every single distance possible. That's a lot more data to work with. Um, so one new component we can use is the closest point. And there's two of them, closest point and then closest point with an S. Right now, we just want the singular uh, instance of that, so closest point. And with this, I'll, I'll show what it's doing uh, in a moment here. But the first thing we can do um, is grab the points from the populate 3D. And we have two options in the closest point here, the points to search from and the points to search. So we have all the points that start and then they will search for their closest match. So we wanna break this Voronoi diagram up um, based on how close each cell is to a point on the curve that we set. So we can add the points from the populate 3D into the searching points and then the points from the curve into the cloud that will be searched. So to visualize what's happening here, um, you don't have to do this, but I'm gonna grab a line component and this will construct a line from a point to another point. So what we can do just to show what this component's doing is I'm gonna make a line from the original cloud of points in the 3D to the points that it found. Uh, on the curve that we set. So you can see that it's breaking up uh, this Voronoi diagram into sections that correspond to the closest point. So now what we can do is measure the distance of these lines. And based on the distance, we can find the ones that are closest to the curve. So we have this big chunk and we can break it up into the smaller chunks that are closer to the line uh, to get something that looks more interesting. Um, but this could also be super useful uh, in finding uh, close partners in other scripts that you might use. 
Okay, so we don't technically need the line. I did it to show um, what the closest point component gives us, as well as the points that it found, is the distance between the original point and the new point. So we don't need to measure the length of line or anything. It's already done that for us in this component. So we can use this value d, the distance value, um, as the, the distance values that we'll search for. So what we can do now is same as what I did up in this one to solve a problem with the colon, is we'll, we'll call out anything or delete anything that's too far away from this curve or the points on the curve specifically. So we'll use the exact, exact same component, call pattern. And we'll be making a true false list based on the distance value here for if we want to delete or keep uh, a cell from the Voronoi diagram. So previously we did an equals to, which wouldn't be super helpful on this one because each distance value is gonna be different. So we want to have, we wanna test for inclusion in a domain. So we say we wanna keep all the cells that are touching the curve. So have a distance of zero up to an upper bound of some distance away from that curve. So in order to do that, there's a component called includes. And this is up in the list operators in the set tab as well, next to list item and list length and all that. Or actually, no, it's in the domain section right here. Um, but what this one can do is this uh, can test for inclusion within a domain. So we'll first want to set that domain. And one way to do that is just write the first and last values, um, but that's not able to be edited. So we'll want to use actual number sliders. So in this sense, I'm gonna do a, a decimal starting at zero and going to whatever upper bounds we want. I'll keep it high. We might go lower than that upper bounds, but just to have the range there. So we'll keep the first one at zero. You don't have to, but for this, we'll keep it at zero. So everything that's the closest to the curve, we'll keep. And then the second slider will be for anything up to, in this sense, 10 units away will also be kept. Anything over that will be, be deleted out of our Rhino view. Um, okay, so the inclusion component's asking for a domain. Right now it comes with zero to one. Uh, we can't just plug these two sliders into the D because it doesn't, a domain has to be two numbers together. So what we can do to construct that domain is get the component construct domain. And this will have two inputs, A and B, and we can add these sliders into that construct domain. And that'll actually create a domain for us that we can use for the inclusion test. So we can plug our two sliders for the lower and the upper bounds into the domain. And this should be giving us, if we hover over a domain from zero up to the 10 or whatever number you have. So we can take that domain and plug that into the domain of the includes component. So now that we have a domain that we're testing for, um, as I said earlier, we wanna be testing the, diff uh, the distance that we calculated earlier. So we can just take that value from D and use that as the value that we're testing for. So this will give us a true false list of if the value of the distance falls within the domain that we set zero to 10. If it's within that, it gets true. If it's not within that, if it's smaller or larger, then it'll get a false value. So with those true falses, as before, the true falses are a pattern of zero and one. We can plug that pattern into a coal pattern into the P. We have the pattern set in there. Um, now what we wanna do is use the actual cells from the Voronoi and either keep or delete those. So once again, um, as before, we're gonna be using this list as what we're keeping and deleting, um, but we've gone through all these steps to get to um, a, a pattern of keep or delete, true or false. Um, because we haven't done any operations on the list itself, we haven't taken items out, we haven't added anything, we haven't flattened or grafted the list, you know, the lines stay consistent and we have the same number of pattern values here, 100, as we do cells. 
So there's 100 cells. So these two sets of data, the cells and the true-false pattern, line up uh, with the length of the list, so 100 and 100. Um, so we're able to use the cells coming out of this Voronoi 3D as the things we either keep or delete. So if we plug that into the list here, now you'll see that with only this one showing in the scene, as we change this domain value, so right now, if I'm at 20, that includes everything, but as I get smaller, you'll see I'll, I'll start deleting cells off of that grid until we get to the ones that just follow the curve we have here. And since this is all parametric and we can change the line in Rhino, if I was to come back to Rhino, and if I was to change how this curve is shaped, so I can maybe move this section up a lot, maybe move this section down a lot. Um, since it's all in a parametric script, uh, the input is affecting the output consistently, constantly. Uh, it'll update the cells that we're keeping or deleting in real time as we change this curve. So the last two components I want to do here um, is right now, this is one... Uh, all of the cells are on top of each other, so it looks like a solid mass. The last thing I'll do just to make it look a little more interesting is, um, and still using some computational power, is to change the size of these cells so that we have a little bit of an air gap between each one. Uh, and really easily for this, we can just scale all of the cells down a little bit to add that air gap. Um, so I can add a scale component into our Grasshopper Canvas here. And this will scale uniformly. So a single scale value will affect the same scale on the X, Y, and Z direction. So it's uniform. There is a non-uniform scale. So you could scale differently on the X, Y, and the Z. Uh, but in our case, we'll just use one that's consistent. So this asks for any piece of geometry. Um, so in Grasshopper, geometry uh, is pretty broad. That could be a mesh. It could be a B rep could be a curve, could be a number, or actually not a number, uh, but any piece of like 3D thing can be a geometry. Um, so we'll take those cells and plug that into G into scale. And I'll just hide or preview off everything else. So we're only seeing the scale so we can see exactly what's happening. Uh, and right now in this, there's um, a factor for the scale. Right now, I think factor comes in at 0.5, so that'll be half scale. Um, one is full scale, zero is infinitely small. Um, so uh, it's kind of like a multiplication scaling factor. But you'll see right now, everything is being scaled as one. So we just took that big mass and scaled it down. Uh, that's not what I want to do. I want to add an air gap between each cell. So I want to scale each cell down independently based on where it is in the scene. So one way to do that is we have this option here for the center of scaling. Right now it's set at the origin of Rhino at zero, zero. But what we can do is change that center to the center of each one of those 100 cells. So we have, or I, in my case, it's 26 now that I've deleted some of the ones that aren't around the, the, the curve. Um, so what we can do now is we wanna find the center point of each of these cells. Uh, what we can do really simple with one component um, is this component called either volume or area, they'll give us different volume or area calculations, but that's not what I'm looking for in this sense. So we can take either of them. But if we plug in our cells, importantly here, what it'll give us is disregarding the actual numerical calculation of the area or the volume is it'll give us the center point of the geometry that we plugged into it. And this is the important part that we want out of this component. There are other components. Um, for centers, um, but the ones that come stock with Grasshopper are only centers for polygons, uh, not 3D shapes. So we'll kind of misuse this area or volume component to grab the center of a 3D shape. So now if we use that center, so we have 26 centers and 26 uh, B reps or those cells from the Voronoi here. So those lists line up, they both have 26 values in them. We can plug those centers 
into the center of scaling here. And if we grab a slider, so I'm going to have a decimal from 0, 0.0 to 1. Oh, make sure you hit enter. And now we can go from nothing to full scale. So if I plug this into F, um, this will be full scale for everything. And we can slide it down. And we'll see each of those cells are scaling independently based on their center. So we can add that little air gap in between each of the cells. So this might bring up a question since the geometry input has 26 inputs, the center has 26 inputs, so those line up, but the factor only has the single scaling factor of 0.8. Um, this still works clearly. Um, so what it's doing is it's just, um, it's looping back over. So this scaling factor is being applied to the first cell, but since there's only one in this list, uh, the 0.8 that I have is being looped back over and applied to the second, third, fourth, all the way down the list. Um, so it just goes and applies that value to every single one. So in this case, um, since it's just a number for a scaling factor, it doesn't have to be the same length of a list as the rest of them. One thing we could do, though, if we want to line it up, um, is we can grab a range component. And what this one will do is it'll, it can give us a list of numbers and we can constrain that list of numbers within a domain. Right now it's zero to one, which is perfect because one is full scale and zero is nothing. So super small. And importantly, we'll wanna have 26 scaling factors if we want each of them to be different. If not, this will again loop over um, and it'll start plugging in the same value into different or multiple cells. But we can use that list length component again. And if we test um, what's coming out of the cold pattern, so 26 B reps, we'll get a value of 26. Um, and before plugging it into range here, you'll see that the range as it comes has a number set at 10. But if we look at the output here, you'll see we have actually 11 values coming out. So this would give us an issue if we didn't fix it beforehand. Um, it's giving us 11 because it's a range between two numbers. So that, that last number is adding on the extra, so 10 becomes 11. Um, but what we can do is with this list length is we can, yeah. I'm not able to see the... With this component, the scaling? Uh, yeah, I okay, yeah, let me come on, let me come back. But I'm just saying, but if you're thinking we can just subtract by one for that function. Yeah. Uh, so what you can do is you can double click again on the canvas. And this time, instead of typing zero dot dot one, you can do zero point zero. So a decimal place and then two dots and then one. So now your slider should be a decimal slider. Yeah, and you'll have that, that value. So those numbers are probably just too big. So that first one, if you put that to zero, you can slide it all the way down. And that, that big one, you probably slide it down as well. I don't know how big your box is, but. Okay. Great, if we play ball, you can do Nice to meet you. That number is bigger since you lost it. Yeah, maybe you did it to just to show the lab. I feel like I have like every single step in red. So the rest is showing up. Yeah. Right? You so could you go just to show that last. Oh, so I just I did. I didn't. Oh, yeah. yeah, I just did like, the, the blindfold. I just blindfold everything except everything. Yeah. So you just had to use the screen sheets. Oh, so right. you were looking at the data from beforehand and the data from after. So it was just overlapping a lot. So what this green one does is only like in the so you can uncheck that. Yeah. yeah and then just go select everything yeah. before that poll. So everything's left and just do all that on. Yeah. 
Okay, so for this one, the final thing here, um, you've probably already done this, but we'll just um, subtract the list length by one because the range is going to add one. So we're just preempting that. So you could use a value slider or you could use a panel, just add a one. And we'll subtract 26 by one, get 25. So if we plug that into the number of steps for the range, then we'll only get uh, 25 steps. So we'll end up with 26 values. So now this list, 26, lines up with the 26 cells from earlier. Your number is probably going to be different. Um, but we have 26 values from 0 to 1. It's going to give me an error because you can't scale by 0. Um, but it's not going to actually affect the view. But now you can see, since we have 26 scaling factors, we'll have 26 different sizes of the cells there. Just get out some little more interesting question. Yeah, so if you hover over like any output, I could hover over the L here from the call pattern. And you'll see at the very top there, it says there's 26 values in the list. So that'll kind of tell you. Um, but you can also use the list length component, and that'll like numerically give you an output value of 26 or whatever number you have. Yeah, so that's that for the 3D, unless anyone has any more questions. Um, but before we ended, I was just going to go over um, downloading a plugin, installing it into Grasshopper, just so everyone knows what to do. Um, but if there is any questions, let me know before I like start doing that. Yeah. yeah. So when I plugged it in my the, the scale, mm -hmm. scale parameter, that just got, it just went over it. The parameter did? Yeah, mine's red too. So <laughs> the thing is you can't scale by zero. So we could fix that really easily. You can make a domain with the construct domain component or you could write it in a panel. So I'm just going to do, instead of zero, I'm going to do 0 0.1. And then for writing domains, you want to write it like this. So a number space two space another number. So I'm just going to, instead of doing zero, do 0 0.1 to one. That's my new domain. And then the red will go away just because we're not scaling by zero anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So that list one should be whatever number of values you have. Yeah, so you just hover over the L. It'll show you to the left of it. You hover over the L. So you won't be able to see the thing. Um, so what we'll want to do is subtract that by one first because the range is going to add one and you want to line up those numbers. So if you get a subtraction component, you can just double click and type that a minus sign to use it to do it. Yeah. And then in the B, we'll just want to put a value of one. So you can use a panel for that one. And then the list link is showing us the value of six. So we'll just take that to A. So six minus one is five. So that's the number of values we want. So we'll take that into the end of the range. And then with that, if you have to get R again. So if you cover it over there, we'll get it right there. So you'll see. And you have six values. So six minus by one is five, but the range adds one. You have six. That's all you need to know. And then if you plug that into the F instead of the slider you have there, 
You don't have to disconnect it. You could just slot, put it in and it'll replace it. And then check a red, it doesn't matter. Um, because we're scaling by a factor of zero for the first one. So I'm saying uh, it's not actually affecting anything. So if you preview off everything except for the scale component. No, so this will be the very last one. So just preview off everything before. And then now we're seeing we have all the different scales. So there's six different ones. Yeah. Okay, so um, we're at seven. I think the class says five to eight, but I always go to seven max. So um, if you want to leave, totally fine. But I was going to quickly just look at installing plugins. I'll put a video up on Discord as well for installing plugins if you want to know how to do that. Um, but for Grasshopper, um, there's a specific way to do it. And next class, we'll be using uh, these two. Um, so the first one we'll be using is this one called Shortest Walk, which what it does is if you have a line system, it'll find the shortest path between two points. Kind of nice. And then this Dendro one, which is a voxel based uh, meshing algorithm, uh, which we'll see how that works next class as well. But um, yeah, I'll put this video up as uh, just this section as well for installing because there's a couple of buttons you have to hit. But just simply for installing plugins to Grasshopper, it's not hard. There's just something you have to be careful with um, when you do it. So, first thing, most plugins for Rhino or Grasshopper, I guess both are going to be on this website, Food for Rhino. I'll put these links in the Discord so everyone has access to them. Um, but what we'll want to do is you have to be logged in for this to work. So you'll have to make an account for this site. Uh, super easy. And then once you're in, you'll actually be able to have access to download them. You'll always want to download the most up-to-date uh, plugin. So this is the most up-to-date one at the top here. So once you hit download, you'll get either a zip file or a single file, uh, such in this case is only one thing. Um, when we do that, uh, we'll want to come to where it downloaded on our computer. So we see the plug in there, shortest walk. If you select it and go to properties, um, the one thing you have to do for every single component plugin when you're adding it to Grasshopper is to come in here and, and unblock it first. So Grasshopper is able to see it on your hard drive. Um, so always important, you have to hit unblock. And you hit unblock before you unzip a file, if it's zipped. In this case, it's not. So we'll hit unblock, hit apply. OK, good to go. Um, and then back in Grasshopper itself, there's not a nice button to just add plugins. What we have to do is come down to file, special folders. Uh, and it's always either components or user objects. Uh, in the video, I'll put on Discord, it'll explain the difference between the two. Uh, but mainly rule of thumb is if anything is has like a green or a white uh, little uh, thumbnail to it, then it's, or a purple, it's probably a, probably a component. If it's orange, it's probably a user object thing. So that's the main difference. Um, so for the one we just downloaded, and this is the, the last step here for this is we see that this shortest walk plugin is green. So we would drag this into the library folder that we pulled up from Grasshopper. So folder components folder is that one. And we'll just drop that in there. Uh, you can then once it's in there, I already have it somewhere in here. We can close this out, restart Grasshopper Rhino. And when you open it again, your Grasshopper will now have that plugin installed. Um, Dendro is one of the ones we'll have. So it'll be up here with all the rest of the components. And you can search for uh, those components as well once it's all installed. So um, I'll put these links in. We'll have these for next time. That's kind of the homework is just get these two plugins. So we're good to go for next class. But yeah, that's it. So hopefully today was interesting. Thanks for, thanks for being here. We'll see you next Tuesday. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.